Welcome to the Christian Ministries Church Podcast. My name is Josh Barnett. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. We're praying that this message equips and empowers you to live in the kingdom of God. Well, we are um, we're continuing our uh, Zoe Life series, looking uh, at some things from the book of First John. And so if you want to go to First John chapter 3, I'm going to read a couple of verses and we're going to dive into this tonight. I'm super excited about this word. Um, I'm also, also preaching Sunday morning. Um, and I'm really pumped about what God has on my heart for Sunday morning as well. So um, don't miss out. I will be taking attendance and making sure you're all there. So um, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know what we will, that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. And I love, <clears throat> I love just these first few verses uh, here. Um, where it talks about, if you look at other translations, it talks about what manner of love is this that has been lavished on us that we are called the children of God. That that's how, I love how John starts this here. What manner of love is this? His love has been lavished on us, and it's been lavished on us in such an incredible, great measure that we did not deserve, that we couldn't have earned. It was simply a measure of love that was given, freely given to us that he called us his children, that he's given us his love in such greatness. And don't ever let that be something that becomes old and mundane or like, yeah, I know that. I believe that if you're living in the love of God, that that is a continual mystery about like, how can he love me as much as he loves me? And it's a continual uh, just wrecking, wrecking of your heart. And Paul prays it in Ephesians chapter 3 that you would experience the great vast love of God, that it would be something that we constantly encounter and experience and something that constantly leads us into his presence, that leads us into transformation. This love of God that has been lavished on us. And John wants us to see it. He says, see this love, behold this love. And this is a key that we see to the like, essential key, like absolutely necessary. If you want to live in the Zoe life, the God kind of life, the abundant resurrected life, you have to believe that the love of God has been lavished on you. That he, that he made you his child when you had declared him your enemy. Romans chapter five, that while you were a sinner, while you were an enemy of God, that Christ died for you. This great love has been lavished on us. John says to behold this love, he wants us to see it. Seeing this love, it, it, and it, it's, it's just a lifelong process almost of becoming convinced of how love we really are. Now, I, I was teaching our Bible class the other day that the, the cross is two things. The cross, the cross shows us, number one, uh, how, that, that God hates sin. And the reason that he hates sin is because it separates us from him. So the second thing that the cross reveals to us is, is our value. That for God so loved us that he sent his son. The, he hates the sin that separates us from him and it shows us our great value, this great love that he has for us. And we, we see this love and we have to become convinced of this love and become convinced of our great value and become convinced of our great purpose. I'm fully convinced that people, that, that Christians or, uh, or, or even people who have maybe become a Christian and walked away or whatever, there was, there's something that happened where they were never fully convinced of how loved, they were, how loved they are. Christians that fall into great sin are people who quit beholding what John says, this love. When people fall out of the Zoe kind of life, it's because they quit beholding this love and seeing this love or believing this love that has been lavished on them. This measure of goodness and kindness is supposed to ruin you for anything else. Sin loses its taste when you taste the Father's love. It's not, the, the love of God is not something to just be known conceptually, but to be experienced. And sin loses its taste when you experience the great love of God. What's incredible about this is like, God could have just saved us from hell. Period. He could have just saved us from hell. He could have just taken away the consequences. He could have just forgiven us. But he did so much more than just forgave us. 
He, did more, he actually did more than justify us. He did more than redeem us. He did more than set us free. He could have just done those things, but he did something that is even greater than all of those things. He adopted us. He made us his sons and daughters. He could have just saved us from hell and said, that's good enough. But he did not do that. He adopted us into his family. He has made us his sons and daughters. All of those things are more than enough, but what he does in making us part of his family far outweighs the rest. He has made us his very own. That is monumental. The gospel is so much more than you have been saved from hell. That is part of it. But is that you have been adopted into his family, that you have been made his sons and daughters. You ha- <clears throat> yes, you've been saved from hell, but, it's so, but what you've been saved for is much more important than what you were saved from. You were saved to know and experience the great love of God. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Bill Johnson says that the Son of God became the Son of Man so that sons of men could become sons of God. And that is the hinge point. Because knowing and believing this identity is what transforms us. We have become Athanasius. Athanasius is a, a patristic father. He's actually the first guy that compiled the books of the, uh, the New Testament, 27. He said, it's these and no more. He, he, he actually said something along these lines. He said, we have become sons of God so that we might live like God. We have become sons of God so that we might live like Jesus. That God became man so that man could become like God. Romans 8 says that we have been predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Believing in Christ begins this process of becoming more and more and more like him. That's why John says in verse 2 that when we see him, we will be just like him. And there's a manner that we see him now. He's looking, he's looking, John is looking at now and he's looking at the future. He's looking at you've been saved now, you can see him now. There's there to an extent you live like him now, and then also when we are glorified, when we are, uh, when we begin, when we're absent from this body and we become present with him in spirit, then we are, ju- we, we are just like him. When we get, we all will get resurrected in new bodies one day and then we will be just like him. But also John is saying, you can see part of him now. We witness and we testify and we behold his love and we have been transformed and empowered to live like him now. Y'all are tired tonight. Glory. I'm going to start handing out energy drinks on the way in. Tell Sage to give out some free coffee. This great love has made us children of God. And it leads to this Zoe kind of life that we are talking about. This is how, and so the, the next part of this, I want to talk about this, basically three ways. I want to give you three ways tonight that, uh, uh, of how, the ch- how children of God are supposed to live. Uh, how we live the Zoe life. Zoe life is one that John begins to describe. Number one, we live in victory over sin. We live in victory over sin. John goes on to explain in in this chapter that basically we've experienced this love and it should produce righteous living. It should produce righteous living. Verse 9, he says, Those who have been born into God's family, that's you and I, the children of God, they do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they, keep, so they cannot keep on sinning because they are children of God. Because I am a child of God, I cannot keep on sinning. And John's not necessarily saying this as a command. He's saying this is that that testifies that you are a child of God because you're not living in sin. It's not a command that John is saying. He's saying because that is your identity, you now live like him. Sinning should not be normal for believers. We, we, bear with me, because I think sometimes we get inundated with just things that pastors said to us for years and years and years, even things that I'm guilty of saying that actually it's not in the Bible. Sinning shouldn't be normal for believers. We shouldn't sin every day. And if you sin every day, there's, there's a sanctification problem. There's a miscommunication on how we're actually supposed to walk this thing out. We shouldn't sin every day. <clears throat> Your spirit is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, listen to me, the Holy Spirit is a lot stronger than your flesh. 
It's a lot. God is stronger than your flesh. So you can actually walk in victory over sin. You don't have to sin. You don't have to live a lifestyle of sin. When we live in him, we become like him. Proof of you living in him is holiness. Living in this holy love produces holy behavior. It says in in verse 8, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil in you. John is saying he's destroying the works of the devil in you, so you shouldn't still live like the devil. (laughs) And and, and listen, there's there's a difference in committing sin and continuing to sin. Living in sin is not supposed to be normal for believers. Jesus is our example. Our goal is to be like him. But being born again is not to make you a less dysfunctional version of yourself than you were before. Being born again is not being a less dysfunctional version of yourself than you were before. Being born again is being completely made new, a new creation, and living like a new creation, not a better version of who you used to be. Romans 6, Paul says, if we've died to sin, how can we continually live in sin? Jesus died to take away our sins. He died to take away our sins. He didn't die so that you would just sin a little bit less. He didn't die so that you could be a little bit better this year than you were last year. He didn't die so that you could just be a better leader, a better worker, a better spouse. He died so that you could be a new creation. To be born again. And the church is too often guilty of boiling down the gospel to like a leadership TED talk. And it is not a leadership TED talk. We're not trying to make a better version of you. We're trying to make you like him. That's the goal. We're trying to make ourselves like, or, or he makes us like him. But it's, it's I was, I was a, a teaching or leaders academy class today and, I, and, I, and I, I let them know like Jesus did not die on the cross so that you wouldn't have to. He died on the cross to show you how. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me. So you, you want the Zoe life. It comes with a death to the old me. I have got to die. Josh Barnett can no longer live. I, Galatians 2.20, I have been co-crucified with him. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Come on. In verse 6 of this chapter, John says, anyone who lives in him will not sin. In, in, in 1 John, Tim talked about this in 1 John, but it, it, it says, uh, 1 John chapter 1, it says not, John doesn't say when you sin, there's, there's a propitiation for your sins. You can be forgiven. He doesn't say when you sin. He says if you sin. That's the word he uses. He doesn't say when you sin. Because, because what we've done, because there, we use this dismissive language all the time. And I'm guilty of using this dismissive language too. Of like, you're going to blow it. You're not going to be perfect. Only Jesus is perfect, brother. You're going to mess up. You're going to sin. Well, yeah, with that mindset, you are. But that's not the mindset that we're called to live. We have the mind of Christ. Jesus didn't walk around with a sin consciousness. He didn't walk around thinking that he was going to blow it all the time. We cannot walk around with this sin consciousness thinking that we're going to blow it every single day because if you think that you're going to blow it every single day, you probably are. But if you are thinking on these things, if your mind is fixed on heavenly things, on the heaven reality, if you're abiding in him, not just on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, but if you're living in him, if you're, I love, a, there's, a, there's a small book that was written a long time ago by a guy named Brother Lawrence. If you're practicing the presence of God, where you're not just visiting him on Sunday morning, but you are living in the presence of God, you will start to sin a lot less. You will begin to walk just like him. <clears throat> I just, I don't see Jesus telling, hey, you're going you're gonna to leave this place, you're going to blow it, but it's okay when you do, I'll forgive you. He, he tells lots of people, go and sin no more. That, and that's not legalism, that's freedom. That's grace. Grace empowers righteous living. Uh, 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 Charles Spurgeon says that, uh, that a grace that leaves me bound is not grace. I don't want to be bound to my sin. I don't want to struggle. It's not normal in the life of the believer to struggle. This isn't legalism. This is freedom. 
And when you are a child of God, when you're living and abiding in Him, you're remaining in Him, you lose the taste of sin. I don't want to sin. I don't have a desire to sin. Does temptation come? Sure, but I take that thought captive and I move on. Are there times where are there times where frustration happens and I say something I shouldn't or I look, look at something I shouldn't or I, my eyes linger on something they shouldn't linger on or I have a thought that I've been dwelling on or, or I treat somebody, you know, I get, I get mad at Lucas at work because he did this and so I treat him in a whatever way. Yeah, sure, sometimes, but, it, but <laughs> that is not my lifestyle. I step back into forgiveness and go, that's not really me. But then I don't live going, oh man, I hope I don't do that again. I hope I don't do that again. I hope I don't do that again. I, I live looking at Jesus and beholding him and walking in the Zoe life and building his kingdom every single day. Okay, we have Zoe life. We have God's life. We cannot keep on sinning. That's not a command. It is actually we lose the ability. We lose the want to. We lose the taste for sin. Our desires have changed. When we hold him, we cannot hold our sin. It, it is impossible to hold your sin in, one, sin in one hand and your Savior in the other. They're going in different directions. And a lot of times, the reason believers are feel like they're, they're so anxious or they're so depressed or they're so stressed out or they're so, they feel like they're being torn apart, oftentimes because they're lukewarm and they're trying to do both. And you can't do both. You, it's, 1 John is very clear here. We cannot live in the world and live with Christ. We can't do both. Children of God walk in victory over sin. By His grace, we are free from sin. And listen, if you're going through sanctification, if you're struggling, struggle forward. Walk in victory. Take extreme measures to cut sin completely out of your life and understand that victory is yours. And you need, maybe you just need to be more convinced that you are a child of God. You are a child of God. Most, in the, I mean, you can look in at just different psychological studies, but most people, they are and they act in a way of, of, of who they believe themselves to be. And many times Christians struggle because they don't see themselves the way that God sees them. Because God sees you as righteous. Colossians says that he sees you as holy, faultless, and blameless. What if you begin to see yourself that way? Holy, flawless and blameless that I have been given the righteousness of God in Christ that I am as righteous as Jesus is righteous not based on your behavior I'm not saying it's anything that you worked your way into but you have really been forgiven you have really been redeemed you have really been washed white as snow come on in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit brings conviction and, and, and understanding that conviction is not condemnation. Condemnation is the devil telling you that you did that and that's, it's, because of you, it's because you're a pervert or it's because you're broken or it's because you're this or because you're that. That's condemnation. Conviction is the Holy Spirit coming and saying, hey, there's more in the house for you. Conviction is more... Uh, I, I was telling... Um, I don't know where I was preaching. I feel like it was to a room full of young people. Um, Conviction oftentimes is God just coming to convince you that you are his child. He's coming to convince you that, hey, what you just did, that's not you. Grace, the, the, the Hebrew word for grace literally means to stoop down and pull up. Grace is God stooping down and pulling you up. Not rubbing your nose in it, but saying, hey, you, that's not you. That's not who I created you to be. I've got more for you. Come out of that and come close to me. <clears throat> Jesus takes away our sins. He saves us from our sins. He saved us from the penalty, the power, the presence of sin. Grace is confrontation. It's confrontation with perfect love. We never, never are we supposed to sign a peace treaty with sin. We never wink at its presence or excuse it by saying everybody's got their own area, they got their own struggle, Jesus understands. That's n we don't wink at sin that way. This completely goes against everything that we are in Christ and the work that he has done in our life. 
John says in this chapter, whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. To live a lifestyle of habitual sin is to demonstrate that you have not seen him and you do not know him. If you're struggling, you've got to ask yourself, how much are you beholding him? If you're struggling, how much are you abiding in him? How much are you remaining in him? Is abiding a lifestyle to you or is it part-time? Because it's not supposed to be part-time. And many people I believe, many people I meet that are struggling with a certain sin and they keep going around the same mountain is because they're trying to abide part-time. And we don't do that. We have to abide full-time. But John leaves no room here for it. He does not allow us to separate our righteousness, for our, 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 our justified position from our behavior, that we are righteous, we are in right standing. And John is making it very clear here that we will also then live righteously because of that right standing. And if we're not living righteously, there's something that's wrong here. We're not in right standing. We've got to be in right standing. Oh, I hear I got the Charles Spurgeon quote right here. The grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. Mm. The grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. We can live lives characterized by righteousness, not sin, because we have been given the righteousness of Jesus. He is righteous and he has every resource we need to live righteously. And, and, and honestly, I'm all for accountability, but your accountability partner is not going to keep you free from sin. Because you can hide from everybody. You can hide from your spouse. And they see you more than anybody else does and probably have more access than anybody else does in your life. And you can hide from them. You can hide from everybody. There's only one person you can't hide from. The Holy Spirit. Right? He sees. He sees. He knows. And you have got to steward your relationship with him if you want to walk in victory, if you want to walk in freedom. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And when people look at me and they tell me like, oh, nobody's perfect, you're going to struggle the rest of your life, you're going to want that is not what Christ paid for. Christ paid for you to be completely redeemed and set free and be a new, beautiful creation for the rest of your life. Come on. All right, the second thing that John, well, actually, I want to say this, the, Paul, Paul pretty much preaches the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says that as believers, we're to put off our former conduct, our old man that has been corrupted with deceitful lust, and we're to put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, so that's the Zoe life. The first part, we, we, John is showing us we can live in victory over sin. This is the first thing he shows us here. The next thing that he shows us is we are, a way that we display this righteousness is love for each other. Love for each other. Are we supposed to love our enemies? Yes. But John specifically says love for other believers. Love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. If we are truly children of God, then we will show it we will show it in our likeness to the Father as he loves the children of God, so will we. We will love our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we walk in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. And loving others is a sign, a confirmation that you have been saved. If you don't love other believers, you may need to check your relationship with the Lord. Not just the ones that you like. Not just the ones that look like you. That talk like you. That have the same skin color as you. That dress like you. Not just those. But all brothers and sisters in Christ, even if we don't agree on everything. Even if we believe a little bit differently about politics or money or business or family or friendships, there's, gonna, there's, gotta, there's always going to be some disagreement. People are going to do things a different way than you, and that's okay. If it's not sinful, it's okay. There's going to be things that we disagree on. If it's not an essential thing, then we're still supposed to love each other. We can, we can even believe a little bit differently about God. Not a lot. There are essential things. Like, you know, I'll just give you an easy example. I, I've got brothers in Christ who are Calvinist. And I believe that they love the Lord and I see fruit of God in their life. But just because they're a Calvinist and I'm not, doesn't mean that I get to break fellowship with them. 
I still, can we, listen, you and I probably disagree about the end times. Probably, I may have some of the weirdest beliefs in here about the end times. We probably disagree. But it doesn't give me the right or you the right for us to be offended at each other and just walk away and break fellowship over something that's not essential. Come on. I'm not, and, and, and I'm not a Calvinist. I, I was kind of one for a little while, and then I had kids, and I realized that um, they weren't predestined to go to hell. Um, but they were predestined to be like Christ, is what Romans said. <laughs> but we can still love Jesus. Like, listen, I pray in tongues a lot, and I know some of you that don't. And you might think I'm weird that I pray in tongues, and I think you're weird because you don't. That's okay. We can still be brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not essential. We got we to gotta stop separating and dividing over things that aren't a big deal. That's not the Zoe kind of life where we're fighting with everybody or fighting with the family over stuff that's not an essential deal. We've got to love each other. It is not optional. It is a command. Verse 17 of this chapter, John says, if you see a brother or sister in need and you have no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? It's not. It's not in that person. They are not a child of God. And in John 17, Jesus is, is in one of the most important chapters in all of Scripture because it's, it's a direct prayer from the, from the Son to the Father. And it, one of the most fascinating things that he prays is, may the world know they are my disciples by the way they love one another. And so our love for each other should be so different, so sacrificial, so radical that the world looks at us and knows that we are followers of Jesus. I would say that loving one another is pretty important. That's probably why in 1 John, he keeps coming back to it. I don't know if you've been reading 1 John, he's been doing this study, but he keeps coming back to the fellowship, brothers and sisters in Christ, living in love. Jesus talks about it in, in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar and go and be reconciled to that person, then come back and offer it. Wow. Leave worship to God and go make it right with your brother. So it's like, we see this, that this love for each other is more important than the worship. It's more important than the offering. It's more important than the sacrifice. If you feel convicted about not loving believers like you should, start tonight. Start tonight. If the Holy Spirit has told you to do something for someone, do it. If there's a need in the world that bothers you, it may be the Lord telling you to do something about it. Don't ignore it. Being a Christian is a lot more than saying, I'm a Christian. It's a lot more than checking a box. There are, in fact, people who claim to be Christians that aren't. Shocker. Which is a lot more common in the world nowadays. <laughs> How can we know if we are actually a Christian? If we believe truth? If we believe what the Bible says? If we show the love of Jesus to others? And if our conduct has been changed and we are becoming more and more and more like him. The Zoe kind of life requires us to walk in victory over sin and in love for each other. The third thing that John shows us that the Zoe life produces, the last thing here, is it produces confidence before God. Number three, it produces confidence before God. Confidence before God. And I love there's this part in here where, where John says, even if your hearts condemn you, God is greater than your feelings. He's greater than your feelings. And so like when, when you come in, when we come into worship or you go into your secret place or you, man, whatever, like oftentimes like there, there, there can be this thing in our heart where it goes, you're not worthy. You're not righteous. You remember who you used to be. You remember how you were. That's the accuser coming. That's our heart coming to agreement and condemning us but it says that God is greater than our feelings. And so we've got to remember that even if we feel that way, that God is greater than that feeling, and we've got to hold on to truth even if we don't feel like we believe it on a heart level. And, and, and honestly, this is why sin is so dangerous for believer because, because sin for the believer it robs you of the confidence that you're supposed to walk in. It robs you of the confidence that you're supposed to walk in. So if I go lay hands on somebody 
and I'm going to pray for healing. I'm going to pray for something miraculous to happen in that person's life. And I'm walking in sin. You know what I'm thinking about when I go to pray for that person? Sin. Because the devil has got something to accuse me with. Sin is dangerous because it robs us of the confidence that we need. But we have this assurance from the Lord. We have this confidence before God that we actually can live like him. We actually can stay in his presence. And then John ends the chapter with saying, hey, if you walk in obedience, like your prayers are going to be answered. If you're walking in obedience, your prayers are going to be answered. If you're walking in obedience, your prayers are going to be answered. Answered prayer are, is for those who walk in obedience to him. Now, these verses, John's not given all the conditions for answered prayer. Sometimes we ask for things that God ain't going to give us or he ain't going to do in our life. Like, if, are we praying his will? Are we praying his kingdom? Are we praying our own? There's sometimes we pray things as like, God, I ain't going to give you that because it'll ruin you. But are we praying his kingdom come? And when we're walking in confidence, when we're walking into his throne room, when we're coming in, see like in Jesus' name is not a magical prepositional phrase that we tack on the end of a sentence. In Jesus' name means I'm in him. And so as I'm in him, I'm praying these things as if I'm him. I'm in Christ. I'm co-seated with him. And so I'm in his name. When you walk in disobedience to God's word, your prayers will be hindered. Actually, Peter, Peter makes that clear about men and women in, in his book. He talks about different things that you do that like God, won't, God ain't listening to you. He actually talks about, he talks about men and the way that we treat our wives and if we don't treat them right, it's like God does not listen to you. It's like, yeesh, wow, better treat it right. It's a stern warning there. But when you're in him, you can ask things in his name. I'm in Christ, and because I'm in Christ, these things shall be done because they are, it, are his will. And this whole, one of this whole thing, and Paul talked about this uh, quite a bit last week, but this whole, this whole part of, uh, of walking in confidence and walking in fellowship with other believers and, and, and walking in victory of sin, it comes by abiding in him. It comes by walking in fellowship with him. This is John 14 and 15, is that when we remain in him, we are empowered to obey him. And then he says, when you obey me, you can ask anything in my name and I will do it for you. If you but it's in, if you're in me. I think sometimes we just see that last part. There's like, ooh, he's going to answer all my prayers. Yes, if you're in him. If you're abiding in him, if you're remaining in him. <clears throat> he says, if you, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. If you abide in me, if you, and, and it, it's circular, okay? I, I want you to see this, that this is kind of like a circular thing. When you obey, you are abiding in him. And as you abide in him, you are empowered to obey him. And it's this circle of like abiding to obey and obeying to abide. Because sin separates us from God. Because when we sin, we're disagreeing with something that he said. In, in verse 4 of this chapter, it says that, that sin is breaking God's law. That, that easy definition there, sin is breaking God's law. And so we're called to walk in obedience in God's law. And John's making it very clear, like, hey, if you're living in fellowship with him, if you're living in the light with him, if you come into agreement that you are a child of God and you're living close to Abba, you're living close to Papa, you are going to be in him and you're going to be empowered to obey him. And you're going to walk in victory of sin. And so you've got to see this abiding thing as this circular deal where, where one empowers the other and one empowers the other and one, and it keeps going back and forth. And if you have ever had six, if you ever like if there's ever a temptation that comes up and like you obey do you know what you have chose to do you have chose to stay in his presence and so when you obey you are actually abiding in him but when I choose to disobey when I choose to break God's law it actually takes me out of abiding in him it doesn't mean that you're not saved it doesn't mean that he won't forgive you but it takes you out of a degree of his presence that you were called to live in Come on. Our abiding depends on obedience. You cannot abide in him if you're not obeying him. If, you're, if you choose to live in darkness, you will not live in his light. You will not live in fellowship with him. Our abiding depends on our obeying. Moment by moment, the responsibility of the believer is to remain in him. Abiding is the key to obeying. Abiding in him gives you the strength and the want to to obey him. Obey, uh, 
abide to obey and obey to abide. And I want to I want to end with this here is that this man the most incredible thing about Zoe life is that you have access to God. You've got access to God, man. You don't need me. You don't need access to me. You need access to him. I can't do for you what God can do for you. You have access to you have access to the same word that I do, the same presence that I do, the same throne room that I do, the same spirit that I do. You have access to God. You have access to the Father who's always available. He's never, I'm too busy for you. He's not. I'm too busy. Ask, ask Jason every time he calls me, I never answer. I'm too, I'm too busy for you. But God's not. He's always available. Your accountability partner, too busy for you. Your spouse, too busy for you. Your brother, too busy for you. Your pastor, too busy for you. Your mom and dad, too busy for you. Your kid's too busy for you. But do you know who's not too busy for you? God, and you have access to him. Because of Christ Jesus, you have access to the God of the universe. That is not something that we're supposed to take lightly. That is not something that we're just supposed to be like, oh yeah, cool, I have access. No, you have access to the God, the creator of all things. You have access to him. You need access to him. You need to get close to him. Hebrews 4.16 says you can come boldly into the throne room of grace so that you can find help in the time of need. You have direct access to the God of the universe. So listen to me. You have direct access to the God of the universe. Don't settle. Don't settle for him twice a week. Don't you dare settle for him twice a week. The reason that you're struggling may be because you've settled for him 30 minutes on a Wednesday night or an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. The gathering is important. The gathering is, is of monumental importance. Be here. But you've got access to God 7 a.m. tomorrow morning when you're headed to work. You've got access to God when the bills are a mountain high and you have no idea how you're going to get out of it. You have access to God when you're, when you're sick. You have access to God when you're wrapped up in anxiety. You have access to God when you're wrapped up in fear. You've got access to God when you're wrapped up in hate. You've got access to God when you're wrapped up in those things. You don't need, listen to me. You don't need counseling. You don't need a pill. I'm not anti those things. But you've got the great physician. You've got the God of the universe who wants you to come close to him. You've got access to him. Y'all stand with me. <laughs> Man, I'm really excited about what God has laid on my heart for Sunday morning. I really want to encourage everybody to be there. I think it's going to be a powerful, a powerful service. I, want to, I really want to talk about, and I really believe that God is going to mark some people on Sunday morning, but I really want to talk about experiencing the love of God. And not just knowing about it, but really experiencing Him. If you've got access to this God of the universe, how do you open up your heart and your mind to Him to experience Him and know Him on a deeper level? And He's going to take us there on Sunday. I'm excited. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much, God, that we don't have to struggle our entire lives, but God, we're, that we can walk in victory, that your victory is our victory, that you have transferred that to us, God, that your resurrection is our resurrection, that we can walk in true freedom. And God, I'm thankful, for, I'm thankful that even when I have blown it, that you have picked me right back up and put me right back into victory. That even though the righteous man falls seven times, he always gets back up. God, I thank you for this body of believers. Help us to live in the, in the type of fellowship that John teaches here tonight. There's something special about the fellowship, the body of Christ the closeness that we can have that's not the friendships that we can have, the relationships that we can have that are not like the world has, that we can have Zoe life in our relationships with our friends, with our kids, with our spouses, with our parents, that there is a special kind of Zoe life that enters into those types of relationships. God, teach us how to live in that, how to walk in that. Holy Spirit, convict us. Show us the things that we need to forgive, the things that we need to let go of, the things that we don't need to worry about as much, God, that we need to we need to tether together. We need to take the hand of the one next to us and build your kingdom that we get over our little petty differences, God. And Lord, we're thankful that we have 
the assurance, and the confidence that we need to come into your throne room, to abide in you, to remain in you, to be seated in you. We're so thankful to you, God. We worship you. We honor you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Thank you for listening to this message from Christian Ministries Church. If this message impacted you and you'd like to sow into our ministry, you can give at cmchurch.com. If you'd like to listen to more of our messages, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Christian Ministries. God bless.